Let's review the non-spontaneous electrochemical cell. In the last video, we looked at the galvanic or voltaic cell, which is a spontaneous reaction. But what if we want to drive a non-spontaneous reaction? Say we let this reaction run to completion. We just ran out of battery. For example, say you spent too much time on social media, I mean, watching chemistry YouTube videos on your cell phone, and your battery runs out. No more galvanic cell, no more spontaneous reaction. Is it done? Do you toss your cell phone? Do you get a new battery? No, you charge it. If discharging is spontaneous, then charging or forcing the electrons in the opposite direction, the direction they don't want to go, is a non-spontaneous reaction. How do we make the non-spontaneous reaction happen? This is going to require an input of energy, like a cell phone charger, to force the electrons to move in the opposite direction. Electrolysis uses an external energy source to power a non-spontaneous or electrolytic reaction. If you look at the word electrolysis, you have electro for electron and lysis to break. Electrolysis is often used to split a substance apart, often to make pure metals. Take the salt sodium chloride. You've seen the spontaneous reaction where sodium chloride aqueous, meaning dissolved in water, will break apart to give us Na plus and Cl minus. NaCl is an ionic compound and it simply splits apart into the cation and anion in an aqueous solution. This doesn't involve a chemical reaction because nothing changed because the sodium and chloride can still come together to form an ionic compound. In electrolysis, we're looking at a different reaction. This time, we're taking molten or liquid sodium chloride that does not have any water present. This happens when you take a pure sodium chloride crystal and heat it to ridiculously high temperatures, bringing it to the liquid form. And then, through a redox reaction, through an electrolysis reaction, we break it apart to get sodium metal and chlorine gas. Given the high temperatures, sodium is still in liquid form until it cools down to a solid. Let's not forget to balance. 2 NaCl gives us 2 sodium liquid and 1 chlorine gas. So why electrolysis? This is a very, very unfavorable reaction and will require a ridiculous input of energy to make it happen. Since this is a redox reaction, let's take a look at the half reactions. I like to draw my arrows in the same place. On the reactant side, we have 2 Na+, remember this is still an ionic compound, even in the liquid form, goes to 2 Na. Let's omit the phases for simplicity. For the second reaction, we have 2 Cl- going to Cl2 gas. Now remember, when balancing redox equations, as I teach in the video link below, after you balance the atoms, you have to balance the charge. And the way to do that is to bring the higher charge down. So 2 Na plus plus 2 electrons gives us a net neutral to balance the sodium metal. And Cl2 gas plus 2 electrons gives us a net minus 2 to balance the 2 times Cl minus. The first is a reduction half reaction because it's gaining electrons. The second is oxidation because it's losing electrons. From the mnemonic, Leo the lion says, grr, where loss of electrons is oxidation and gain of electrons reduction. Notice that the two electrons cancel out on each side, and when we sum it up, we get our final balanced equation. And given that this is a very unfavorable, non-spontaneous reaction, we need an outside source of energy like a battery to make this happen. In a typical battery, we have a positive end and a negative end, where the positive end is going to attract electrons. Electrons are negative, so they're attracted to the positive. And the negative end, being negative, is where we eject or push out electrons. So electrons go in from the positive side and out of the negative. Ready to put this all together? Here we have our reaction container. 
that is full of molten NaCl. So we have Na plus and Cl minus in the liquid form. They're ionic, but there's no water in this container. Notice that unlike the galvanic or voltaic cell, where we had two half cells, this reaction happens in one single container. The reason for that is in the galvanic cell, we had a spontaneous reaction, where if this was all mixed together, the electrons would simply flow directly from zinc metal to copper ions without the ability to harness any electricity. Here, the sodium and chloride can be bumping right into each other, and they have no desire to give up those electrons. So there's no risk of losing any energy until you start forcing this reaction to happen. First, we need electrodes. On the left, we have the anode, and on the right, the cathode. Now, these electrodes are inert, meaning they don't react, but they do allow electrons to flow through them towards the other side. And of course, we connect it with a conducting wire so that the electrons have where to go. And yet, we have nothing happening. We have lots of sodium and chloride ions floating around, but they're happy. They're minding their own respective ionic business with no desire to react unless we force them. And the way to do that is by putting a battery into the system. I'll put V for voltage source reminding you that we have a positive and negative end to the battery. Back to the half reactions. We saw that the reduction half is where sodium ions go to sodium metal, and the oxidation half is where chloride ions go to chlorine gas. Remember the mnemonic, an ox and a red cat? This told us that the anode is the site of the oxidation half reaction, and the cathode is the site of the reduction half reaction. This holds true in both the galvanic voltaic cell and the electrolytic cell. So on the left where we have the anode, we have the oxidation half reaction. On the right for the cathode, we have the reduction half reaction. If we have the anode on the left, this would give us the reaction of Cl minus going to Cl2. And the cathode will have the reduction reaction of Na plus going to Na. The why behind this is where I used to get so confused in undergrad. So let's break it down and make sure you understand. The anode and cathode, where oxidation and reduction happen, do not change. What changes is the charge of each electrode. Remember, Leo the lion says grr. Leo tells us loss of electrons oxidation. That means if the anode is on the left, we have electrons coming off the anode, flowing up into the wire and into the battery. And GER tells us gain of electrons is reduction, which means that we have electrons coming out of the battery and into the cathode. So what is different? What is so confusing? It's the charges. And in order to understand the charges, I don't want you to think of the reactions themselves. I want you to look at the battery. If electrons are flowing off of the anode into the battery, they're flowing into the positive terminus, and that makes the electrode attached to the positive end of the battery the positive electrode. And if electrons are flowing out of the battery from the negative terminus towards the cathode, that makes the cathode negative because it's attached to the negative terminal of the battery. In other words, the charge of the electrode comes from the side of the battery that they're attached to rather than the reactions happening on the electrode itself. Where did these electrons come from to flow from the anode into the battery? Every time the circuit is turned on, we have a chloride ion being pulled towards the electrode its electron forcibly taken away, and when that happens to two chloride ions, we get Cl2 gas bubbling out of solution. This is why you don't immerse batteries in water, because you definitely don't want to be breathing this stuff in. For every Cl2 that bubbles out, we have two electrons flowing into the battery. If two electrons flow into the battery, two electrons must flow out of the battery towards the cathode. 
and for each electron that flows out of the battery down to the cathode, a positive sodium ion is attracted. It combines with a negative electron to form a neutral sodium. So the battery is the driving force. It pulls electrons from the left, it pushes electrons to the right, and it drives the circuit. Are you with me so far? If yes, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and then hit the bell icon so you don't miss out on any new videos. Notice how there's no salt bridge. In the galvanic or voltaic cell, we had a salt bridge that sent ions into each half cell to balance the changing charge or to prevent the accumulation of charge. But in this case, because everything is happening in one single container, we have no separation of charge and no need for a salt bridge. Join me in the next video for a side-by-side -side comparison of galvanic or voltaic cells versus electrolytic cell to make sure you truly understand the difference. And you can find this on my website link below or by going to my website, layerforsci.com slash electrochem.